Hello and welcome to today's event. I'm James Davis, Mechanical Engineer and Region LGBT Plus Inclusion Leader, Arab Singapore. Today I represent the British Chamber of Commerce's Diversity and Inclusion Committee and shall be moderator for today's event. The goal of the Chamber's Diversity and Inclusion Committee is to provide a forum for members to promote D&I in the workplace by raising awareness and sharing best practice around various challenges and opportunities, building relationships with and providing inspiration, encour encouragement and support to members, engaging with and empowering local business leaders, employees and other communities, influencing relevant stakeholders and generally contributing towards enhancing the reputation of the Chamber as an organisation committed to diversity and inclusion. We note that the gender diversity topics are primarily covered by the Chamber's Women in Business Committee. Today we'll be uh, focusing on inclusion relative to people of LGBT plus um, community. Today's event has been made possible by the Chamber's Diversity and Inclusion sponsor, Barclays. I'd like to extend our thank you to Barclays for making today's event possible. The British Chamber of Commerce's Diversity and Inclusion Committee today are delighted to bring you a digital networking event focusing on LGBT plus inclusion in the Singaporean workplace. The main point of discussion will be regarding pride networks within organisations as well as other initiatives supporting LGBT plus inclusion in the workplace. An a pride network for this purpose of this discussion, we mean an employee network for LGBT plus persons and their allies to raise awareness about the subject of LGBT plus and promote mutual respect within the workplace. From this webinar, we hope to initiate a more visible and accessible discussion between companies to share knowledge and provide guidance to other organizations on how to build an inclusive workplace for people of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity. Today, I am joined by Olfert DeWitt, Chief Operating Officer at HSBC and Executive Sponsor of the HSBC Pride Network, Joanna Moore, People and Capability Business Partner and Co-Chair of the Singapore Pride Network at MasterCard, Oliver Choi, VP, Asia Pacific Branding and Marketing Lead at Barclays and Co-Chair of Spectrum, Barclays' Employee Network for LGBT plus inclusion, and Paul Tan, partner at Kavanaugh Law, LLP, whom leads the Arcus Pride Network at Kavanaugh Law, Singapore. I'd like to thank our panelists for their time today. Thank you very much for joining us. And so we'll be kicking off with our panel discussion. I'll be starting with our first topic of discussion. And so Joanna, I would like to start with you. So why do you believe that this, I, as in, as in uh, LGBT plus inclusion within the workplace is an important topic? Why do we need to be talking about and implementing inclusion initiatives in the workplace, particularly for people who identify as LGBT plus? Thanks so much, James, and I'm really excited to be here and have the opportunity uh, to talk about this topic because it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And I wanted, when I was thinking about, you know, the business case for diversity and inclusion, um, what really stood out to me is a really personal story um, about my experience of launching uh, the MasterCard Singapore Pride Network in 2018. And it really comes down to really, I guess, the number one um, reason that we drive diversity and inclusion in the workplace, which is around the people. So um, I, I joined MasterCard, I'm from Barclays, and Barclays were very active in this space um, now and, and then when I was uh, there as well. And when I joined, I was really surprised that MasterCard didn't have an active um, pride network in Singapore. And so I started the conversation of seeing if there would be other people that were equally passionate about this um, within MasterCard Singapore and would like to be involved in launching the chapter. And the first step um, we took when I found um, those fellow allies to work with was to set up sort of a, a working group where we invited anyone in Singapore who might be interested in um, Pride initiatives and supporting Pride to come and speak, talk about what our kind of overall aims would be um, for the initiative um, and really share what they thought would be um, useful and helpful for the Pride chapter here. And, you know, in that meeting, we had our head of HR um, for global head of HR, as well as myself and around 10 people. So it was a small um, group. But as we started to talk about the kind of overall aims for the initiative, 
people started to share their personal experiences, um, whether they be around challenges with being out in Singapore, out in the workplace, um, working in other places where they couldn't bring their whole authentic self to work. And it became a very emotional meeting. Um, honestly, one of the most amazing meetings that I've ever been to in my, um, you know, professional career, because, you know, it really came to the heart of why we work on diversity and inclusion and why I personally am such a passionate ally, because, you know, every organisation needs to attract, retain and promote the right people and needs them to be productive and engaged in the workplace. And, you know, especially um, somewhere like Singapore that's, you know, still um, working around um, developing LGBTQ, um, for some people, MasterCard was one of the only places where they could really be their full authentic self. So I think for anyone considering diversity and inclusion, um, creating that environment where pre people can really bring their whole selves to work will significantly impact um, the productivity, um, the personal, so mental health and well-being, and the engagement of their employees. Yeah, fantastic. And really great to hear about you speak, speaking about um uh, individuals being able to bring their self, their full authentic selves to the workplace, how that is really key in building uh, employee engagement and, and encouraging uh, em employee or increasing rate of employee retention. Um, I'd like to pass now to um, Paul. Um, how, what, how do you, uh, what do you think, um, why, why is this an important topic of discussion to you? Why do we need to be talking about LGBT plus inclusion in the workplace? and in particular in Singapore. Oh, um, thanks, thanks, James. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. So uh, let, me, let me just pick up where um, Joanna left off, um, which is sort of on the topic of employees uh, really wanting this. And, uh, you know, speaking for myself, I, I've just moved um, to Clifford Chance Kepner Law, uh, where DNI initiatives are, are talked about um, openly, and, and there's a formal network and structure in which uh, these discussions can take place. Um, that wasn't the case um, where I was before. Uh, and just having that platform and ability to discuss and promote and be part of the conversation, I think, uh, is uh, very much as Joanna says, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. Uh, very welcome. I think it helps um, the development of, of all our lawyers. Uh, and, and helps us grow um, individually, um, but also professionally. Um, and, and so I'll just make two um, additional points. Um, the, the first is that uh, I think employees are demanding um, this sort of engagement. Uh, and that's one of the important reasons why I think companies need to sit up and, and to recognize that this is an important part of how they recruit and retain the best talent. Uh, and just a recognition of the fact that the best talent doesn't necessarily look uh, like, like uh, look, look the same uh, and it's not homogenous and it's not always found in the same, uh, you know, the same uh, person, the same type of person uh, who went to the same school, who looks the same, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so what, what we're doing at, at CC, for example, um, is we've formed a talent leadership group uh, at the APEC level and part of that uh, will involve mentorship programs and other initiatives that will tie in with the DNI initiatives um, throughout the, the network. Um, the second thing I would say is that uh, clients are also uh, demanding this. Um, and uh, as we all know, I think ESG considerations are ranking high in how companies are seeing themselves um, as responsible corporate citizens. Um, and speaking from the service provider to many of these companies, um, if we are advising companies on the, their ESG policies, I think ultimately we need to reflect that ourselves. So uh, it's, it's quite clear that, that there is a, a market-driven, client-driven demand uh, for, for all of us, I think, to, to reflect uh, DV upon uh, DNI uh, initiatives and policies and, and imperatives within our organizations. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, clear that uh, diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives shape 
um, an outsider's perspective, their view of, of an organization. Um, I'd be interested to know uh, how the panelists think that their company's uh, DNI initiatives, particularly Pride Next, have shaped um, the, the image of their organization, maybe in, in the eye of job seekers or people who are looking prospectively to their, those companies as, as an organization to join. Um, Ulfa, I'd be grateful for your thoughts on that. Um, how do you think inclusion initiatives have shaped the image of HSBC? Well, let, let me twist that slightly. Sorry, good morning. I'm Olfer to do it. Um, uh, my passion around this topic and why I think it's important is because when I was a job seeker myself, I was, I, I was out and I actively looked for companies that were supportive. Um, but even then, when I joined a, a company, uh, I literally just started working. I was an offsite uh, of that company, and I heard a, a senior leader of the firm uh, use quite a derogatory word for for gay uh, men. Um, and it was quite innocent in the end. He was trying to get a bunch of guys to come and play football, uh, and when he didn't get much response. It was, ah, don't be such, uh, and I won't repeat what he said. But at the time, young, junior, um, I didn't have the guts to confront him. Uh, and very fair to say, I certainly was not at my most productive in, in, in the, the months that followed, uh, wondering whether I joined the right firm, whether I had a, a, a future a, a, as an out gay man at that firm. Um, in the end, it turned out all for the better. But it's it's very personal that I know that if you're if, if you're afraid you can't be your full self, uh, like Joanna said, if you can't bring your full self to work, you will not be at your most productive. So so for me, uh, I when I was a job seeker, it's a long time ago. Um, I did actively look for companies with active pride networks, uh, and I think that's it's a way to show that. Uh, yeah, as a company, you value uh, diversity and inclusion. Okay, thank you very much for that offer. And um, Oliver, um, our, our fourth panelist, um, what, do you, how, how, what, how is, how, how have inclusion initiatives impacted you, or how, what examples of their impact have you seen? What do you think are the importance of of these initiatives within organisations? It's a two-prong answer to that. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a personal perspective because when you no, know, I was born and bred in Malaysia, so that's where you know homosexuality is probably not you know it, it's not really accepted legally, socially, politically. Um, so I think when you know similar to all, but when I was looking for a job, I was looking for companies that were you know championing the DNIs of the LGBT place. Um, and much like to what Joanna mentioned earlier, I think Barclays is one of the companies that has a long-standing history in LGBT sort of inclusion in the workplace. I think, if I'm not mistaken, we've been around for 20 years, at least an employee network group. Um, so that's something that I took into consideration when I was you know, joining Barclays. And I joined Barclays about three years ago. Um, so I think to the question of how it has changed um, um, sort of the, the political space that we work in, um, you know, similar to what Joanna mentioned, um, when we are looking, but we lead by example in, in essence. So we just, in Barclays at least, what we've done is we have launched a diversity supply global network. So we are looking at our third party supplies to kind of see how diverse they are, and not only in the LGBT space, but in the mental health space, in the gender space, in the multi-generational space. Um, and I think there was a survey that was done, I think last year, where we came up about 8% of our third party suppliers are diversity uh, stakeholder managed. Um, so that's how we're kind of affecting change towards um, sort of the political space and social space that we live in uh, currently, uh, globally as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. So it's um, about time to move on to our next uh, to uh, discussion topic. Um, but before I do that, I quickly just want to ask an open question to to our panelists. How, how do Pride networks um, play a part in fostering inclusive environment? And perhaps I'll start with. Uh, Do you want me to start? Or please, also go ahead. I mean, I think diversity and inclusion has many different topics, from gender to uh, ethnicity to ability, um, and 
uh, LGBT is one of those angles. And I think as a firm, uh, it's important to, to to work across. So so when I look at HSBC, we have employee resource groups covering all these different aspects and and, and even more. So I think um, it's it it's as important as gender or as important as ethnicity. I do truly believe that uh, a firm can be uh, its most productive if it's really diverse. I think there's been many studies that actually show that. So it's one of the important angles of diversity. Okay, thank you. And we're also talking about, you know, eight to 11% of the population that identify as LGBTQ+. So, you know, in a, in a country like Singapore, that's 600,000 people, you know, and in, so it's a significant part of the population and it shouldn't be ignored as part of a broader diversity and inclusion agenda for any um, company that's serious about diversity and inclusion. Absolutely. And I'm glad that we are able to anchor in the importance of Pride Networks into the wider diversity and inclusion initiatives just before we move on to our next topic. And so as we do now move on, um, Paul, I would actually like to direct the, 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 the next question to you first. So talking about Pride um, Networks, I understand that you've been heavily involved in um, Kavanaugh Law, Clifford Chance's Arcus Network. Um, what are the first, in your mind, what are the first steps to take when establishing a pride network or when establishing LGBT plus inclusion initiatives within your organization? Um, thanks, thanks for the question, James. Um, so maybe just to pick up from, from where um, you left off uh, the last question and also just to set the context. Um, you know, I think there's, there was a BCG study uh, recently uh, which showed that uh, probably only about 58% of companies in Southeast Asia have some kind of diversity initiative in place. Uh, but at the same time, uh, more than two thirds of the respondents believe that diversity programs uh, were an important part of the employment context. So um, clearly there's, there's a bit of a, a mismatch there. And I think Pride Networks um, uh, play a role in, in trying to coordinate and facilitate that discussion within um, offices and within organizations uh, in terms of how um, they can be more engaged with um, their LGBTQ uh, employees. So, so then just turning to, to the question of how uh, one gets started with this, um, I think there may be about four or five points um, that, that we could share from our experience. Um, the, the first thing uh, probably is, is to uh, get to grips with um, a structure, um, a steering committee, I think you do need a core um, number of people who are interested in this area and who are committed to it. Um, so within CC, uh, we have about uh, six or seven um, individuals, um, both um, lawyers as well as professional support, um, who have decided that this is, is something that they want to commit to. Um, they have clear roles and responsibilities within the, the steering committee. Um, you often need uh, a couple of uh, really key people like, like Toby who are driving the initiative on a, on a daily basis. But I think you also need uh, champions, uh, role models who are able to speak uh, to the wider management as well. So you, you, I think you want to assemble, if, if possible, uh, a cross-section uh, of the employee profile uh, within that organization. Then the second thing, uh, in, in that regard is, is to set achievable targets. I think when you're first starting out, it's important to gain momentum. Um, so set achievable targets, agree what's most important uh, for that group. Um, start uh, with, for example, anti-discrimination policies um, as something which is fairly low hanging fruit. And then you know, one could move your way up um, to various other um, initiatives within the firm. Uh, the second thing um, area that, that we often start with is looking at HR diversity and, and policy practices. Um, so like I mentioned, having an anti-discrimination policy, for example, is probably the first place that, that most of us would look at. Um, you know, just looking through something as simple as looking through the website of the company to make sure that, uh, that there's no language there which is uh, potentially discriminatory or offensive. Um, uh, that's, that's something which is fairly easy um, to do. 
Uh, but I think you also want to then start looking into, for example, whether um, we should have an internal uh, formal HR or grievance policy uh, or process by which um, individuals who are affected by, uh, for example, uh, you know, discrimination or implied language in, in, in the workplace would have a, a place to go to uh, to sound out. Uh, to say that this has happened, um, can something be done about it, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't necessarily always have to escalate all the way um, to top level management. If it's something that can be dealt with at the HR level, for example, um, that, you know, there are tiers that one could build into the system um, uh, to make sure that it's effective and proportionate to what is being um, uh, seen or perceived uh, within the workplace. Then the third thing um, I think is to try and grow some visibility within the organization as well. Um, that's, that's quite key because um, some studies have found that, that there are many companies in which uh, there are such policies or, or even committees or networks, but uh, uh, very few know about it. Um, so I think it's important to have a, a certain level of visibility, whether it's on the internal uh, web pages, uh, external web pages, uh, there are visible signs um, that, that one could, could have as well, uh, you know, signatures, lanyards. Um, so in CC, for example, uh, you, you, you have the option of, of putting uh, uh, in your signature that you're an Arcus um, ally. Um, and, and so that, that helps to uh, promote uh, visibility of the organization, uh, of, of the committee within the organization, uh, which I think is key to so. Sort of, um, you know, keep people um, aware that, that um, you're involved and, and that there are means to get involved as well. Um, two, two more things I, I would add. Um, first is uh, sort of along the, the same theme of visibility, uh, you might want to, to think about uh, a, a day of activity or, or mark days of significance uh, with some kind of activity. Um, so, uh, at CC, for example, we have uh, Pink Friday um, uh, within the APEC region uh, once a year. Um, all employees, staff, lawyers uh, would wear a pink uh, colored uh, t-shirt, which the firm prints for them. Um, uh, this year, we couldn't do it uh, at the workplace, uh, but we sort of took selfies of ourselves wearing the t-shirts and, and we posted it on LinkedIn. So that's kind of a, a nice, fun, uh, casual way of uh, just trying to drum up uh, visibility for, uh, for the course. Uh, last but not least, um, I think one could look at things like uh, resources and training within the firm. Uh, sensitive Sensitivity training, I think, is, is key um, to a lot of what um, you know, has been said uh, just before as well. Uh, language that one should use or avoid. Uh, we, we've had good sessions uh, within CC, very well attended as well. Um, but I think that the, the other thing is, is also that, that we want to make sure that our next generation of, of leaders within the organization are sensitive to these uh, issues. Um, and so there needs to be training for the executive as well. I think one of the things that uh, really impressed me when, when I was uh, interviewing for, for the role um, within CC was that um, in addition to the various uh, sort of you know, interview questions and scenarios that were laid before you and you're supposed to kind of uh, explain how you deal with that, um, there were uh, topics uh, or scenarios uh, that were uh, put uh, to, to the candidate in which you asked how you would deal with a client who, for example, said um, something uh, potentially offensive about one of the associates uh, on the team. Uh, and you, you were meant to sort of explain how you would deal with that uh, situation. And I thought that that was, uh, was very progressive. I thought that was important as well. Uh, and, and, and obviously by including these sorts of um, uh, issues into the process, uh, when you're promoting someone to the next level, uh, I think that in itself uh, creates an awareness um, that these are issues which the firm takes seriously. So I, I thought that that, that was something that was, uh, was quite remarkable and uh, something that I would recommend um, for organizations that are looking uh, to promote um, uh, uh, diversity and inclusion within the organization.
Okay, thank you very much for that, Paul. We're going to have to move on to our next topic of discussion uh, now, which is looking more at mature pride networks. Um, so, um, Oliver, I'd actually like to I'd like to go to you now for your thoughts. Um, so, you're heavily involved. You lead the uh, Spectrum network at Barclays. So, uh, I understand that when you uh, took over that role. Spectrum was an exist, as you say, it's quite a long, it's been a long existing network within Barclays. And so you, um, you, you took over that role with the, with this existing network. How do you maintain, how did you, how have you found, uh, how do you maintain momentum with a mature pride network such as Spectrum? Um, what do you think are the core requirements to keep that network active and visible? So I think uh, maybe taking a step back, I think when I took over Spectrum and Barclays, I think we had to kind of, I mean, I had to kind of reassess where we are as a network uh, within Barclays and where the problems and challenges lie to maintain the momentum. Because I think, you know, the challenges of having an, you know, an older, more mature network is that you get two uh, very distinct challenges. One is that you get saturation in terms of membership because there's only so many people that, you know, are in a company besides new joiners that are already part of the um, network. Um, and then the other problem is come uh, is apathy basically, because a lot of the initiatives that we could do pre-pandemic was really kind of uh, involving uh, around the same thing was, you know, a lot of virtual events, it was, uh, sorry, it was a lot of physical events, a lot of debates, a lot of conversations. Um, so we had to kind of reframe about how do we then engage some of the more newer joiners or people who are not traditionally in the LGBT sort of allyship uh, sort of uh, sphere. So um, these two problems, what we decided to do was we decided to kind of focus on the concept of intersectionality. So within Barclays, what we have besides LGBT pride networks, we have the gender network, which is called WIN, we've got disability and mental health network, which is called REACH, uh, multi-generational and multiracial. So so what we decided to do was, um, and it's it's a firm wide um, operation, right, where we focus on the concept of intersectionality, where to those of you are not familiar, it's an analytical framework to which where we view ourselves basically um, as uh, political and social people beings, we have different modes of privilege and discrimination, right, so for example, me as a Chinese gay man, you know, as uh, you know, I'm kind of oppressed in sort of the LGBT sense, but as a man, I'm kind of in the workforce, it's a privilege to be. So I think where we kind of cut through the noise is to work with other networks um, and kind of get those membership um, sort of numbers coming through the other networks by doing a lot of uh, intersectional panels on like how does uh, gender and uh, LGBT intersect, you know, what are the modes of oppression that we're not looking at, um, and that's how we kind of maintain that momentum. Um, the other way that we're doing it is to work with sort of external partners, so we've sponsored a lot of um, support root um, sort of organizations, as I'm sure everyone will know, here's Kuchaga, T Project, to kind of get on the pulse uh, topics on what society in general in Singapore is um, kind of focused on. And then we kind of tag on to that to make sure that we're not behind the curve when it comes to a corporate sort of top-down uh, approach. Um, but I'll, I'll pause there because I know we, we I'm sure other panelists would, would like to weigh on this as well. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah, I'd be keen to hear from my, um, Joanna or Olfa uh, your experiences of, of, of either establishing or maintaining Pride Networks within your organisations. Maybe let's start with um, with Joanna. Yeah, I'm very happy to. Um, I think um, Paul actually mentioned something which I thought was really important um, in his earlier um, answer, which was about allies. And I think one of the things we found when we launched our Pride Network is that we didn't want force, to force people to say, I identify in a certain way by being part of this um, part of this group. So our focus was very much on bringing in allies, um, whether you want to, you know, want to self-identify as part of the group, that's absolutely your choice, but bringing in allies. So saying you don't have to identify in this way, you only have to be passionate about it, um, you know, as a diversity and inclusion um, incentive, um, because I think people sometimes didn't feel 100% comfortable um, in you know choosing to be part of a pride network because it did they did feel like they were identifying themselves in a certain way, um, and secondly, absolutely having um, really distinct roles and really clear aims. So you know um, we do uh, at the start of every year we do a kind of committee meeting where we talk about 
different people taking on new roles, bringing new energy um, into um, the, the group and what our, you know, clear kind of um, aims will be for that year. So I feel like because you are asking people to do something out of their passion, um, you know, beyond their day job, if you have those very clear um roles and very clear aims it helps people to focus what time they have on um, those key activities throughout the year for sure absolutely and uh, before we move on to the next section i um, would like to hear from alpha um, your your thoughts on on what uh, paul oliver and joanna have been saying and your own experiences as well yeah, I fully agree, and I don't want to repeat what 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 the three of them said. I think the only thing to add is is a certain rhythm um, to get to keep the committee going. So so make sure that there is a regular th rhythm, uh, which of course is a bit more difficult uh, during COVID times in order to meet in person. But still, I think a, a rhythm is important to keep everybody engaged. Um, but other than that, I agree with everything said about visibility and allies. And yes, brilliant. Um, Alpha, perhaps could you share with us any anecdotes or stories of, of a particular initiative that has um, come out of a Pride Network within your organisation that you think has been particularly successful? Ooh. Um, I think ally trainings are 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 a way to achieve kind of many things at the same time. Um, so it, it helps educate uh, people who are not as, uh, as, as knowledgeable about the topic, about how, what it means and how they can help. Uh, it creates visibility. It, it, so, so I think ally trainings are, are a key part. It differs a bit, of course, in the countries where you're working in, I mean, uh, that's important in, in in Singapore. Before this, I was based in London. There, you it, it's kind of a, a different. There, you participate in 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 the big Pride festivals, etc. But I uh, so it depends a bit on 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 the setting. But but I think here in Singapore, uh, uh, from Ally trainings. But last week we did kind of virtual cocktail sh sh shaking uh, lessons with the, with the Pride Network, with, which is equally fun. So um, many different but I would call out the ally trainings. Fantastic and I think in Singapore uh, allies are of particular importance to foster those inclusive environments within the workplace of course the um, the, the out LGBT population is 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 s s certainly smaller than the, than than the ally population and those people being visible in the workplace is is, is key to our other panelists so can do any when we've when hearing Alpha talk about uh, the, his uh, initiatives in HSBC. Does that bring to mind any successful initiatives within your within your organisations? Um, actually, for me, uh, we launched Pride in twenty eighteen. As as I said earlier, we weren't quite sure um, what the engagement would be in the population and as part of that we you know we had our pride t-shirts I'm wearing a um, pride t-shirt today and we said you know if you come to the pride initiative you know have a t-shirt and as we led up to the launch um, people started coming down you know the two co-chairs asking for t-shirts can I have a t-shirt can I have a t-shirt and we're going oh god oh we've run out of t-shirts and by the time the day came around, we had to get a bigger room. It was the biggest turnout to a BRG event that there's ever been in Singapore. And the room was just an absolute rainbow. Um, and for those of us that are so passionate about launching this initiative and being involved in it, it was actually a really, really emotional moment to see how much our employees engaged um, with Pride and embraced it um, as part of um, our, our DNI initiative. So that was a real standout for, for me um, and our journey with Pride. Is that um, if you give out free stuff, they will come. So <laughs> I think when 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 we because we can't support Ping we can't sponsor Ping because obviously Paul, as you know, the regulations uh, with foreign companies. So when we had uh, I think Ping 20, 2019, um, you know, we kind of you know made Ping shirts like two hundred of them. I think our membership is only for hundred fifty. Uh, I think in fifteen minutes they all went out the door. Um, so that was 
that was pretty cool. But I think um, just to note on that, um, on a more serious point, uh, what we've done uh, in Barclays is to really engage HR. Um, and um, over the two years, uh, because of the regulation and legal changes in India, um, that kind of, you know, uh, well, they, they repealed 377. Um, what we've done with HR is to maintain um, uh, sort of homogenized policies across Hong Kong and Singapore. So sort of gender affirming surgeries in Singapore is now covered by our insurance provider. Um, and we have sort of gender neutral um, sort of primary caregiver um, if you want to become a parent. Um, so that's something that Spectrum is match champion within Barclays and we're kind of part of that for so, so. Okay. Brilliant. I am going to have to now move us on to our fourth and final discussion topic. Uh, Ulfa, I'd like to direct the question to you this time. Um, how? So uh, I think we, we, it's quite clear that there are uh, many organisations in Singapore that have these um, pride and LGBT plus inclusion initiatives within their organizations. But there may be some companies in Singapore, and likely there are, that are not quite so far along on their DNI journey as, as, as perhaps some of, the uh, some of the organizations our panelists join us from. How can organizations support each other um, in developing their inclusion initiatives? How can we collaborate between companies to help, um, to help each other? Yeah, no, it's it's a good point. I mean, not every company is the same, uh, not every country is the same, uh, and therefore we do need to support each other, learn from each other. Um, and the fact that companies are not as far along the journey, that's not only corporate values, it's also sometimes dependent on simply having kind of engaged individuals who start a network on the ground in a country who are passionate about a topic. Um, because any employee resource group needs kind of enthusiastic grassroots uh, push as well. So it can be that, but it can also be affinity of senior management in a country with this specific topic. So for, for this reason alone, I think it's important we learn from each other. Uh, there are networks of pride networks in Singapore, um, mainly industry focused, but Interbank is a good example. Um, and it's, it's, it's good to see that while we compete fiercely with the likes of City and Barclays in the market, uh, in the Interbank setting, we actually do support each other. Uh, we organized, HSBC organized together with City uh, a, a a DNI panel discussion a few months ago on uh, workplace wellness because the chairs of, of both of the Pride networks realized that, that the lockdown or the circuit breaker was especially hard for younger LGBT colleagues who lost access to their support network. So they organized this DNI forum jointly. Um, and the member banks do organize activities that are open to other banks. And, uh, and I do know that there are sim similar networks in, in, in the other industries. Um, jumping on what Oliver, Oliver just said, but just like there's differences between companies, there's also differences between countries. Um, and throughout my career, I also had quite some interaction with colleagues in other countries to, to support them in their activities. So when I was a partner at the Boston Consulting Group, uh, I led their uh, LGBT, LGBT network in Europe. Um, and at the time, we actively supported the establishment of our Latin American network, which was very much uh, driven by one or two local enthusiasts who we brought along to Europe to show to in include in our activities so they sh they learned what what could be done but also me having discussions with the leadership in Latin America just to explain uh, the business case uh, like we started out in this panel discussion just explaining the value of LGBT inclusion because for 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 a number of the senior partners in Latin that this wasn't a topic that was that they were that knowledgeable about. So, so I think those are examples uh, of things you can do. Uh, within HSBC, I, I do quite a bit with our networks in India and Sri Lanka. Um, and with colleagues in India, uh, many discussions because they have become very active uh, and they have a huge network, but they don't see a, a big increase in out LGBT colleagues in the workplace. Uh, their network is mainly allies and they wondered whether they were doing something wrong but 
uh, I try to explain that that you can have the most inclusive workplace, but if colleagues, if the if the outside world is a bit more socially conservative, then it doesn't mean that people will be automatically fully out in this inclusive workplace because if you don't want your family or friends to find out then yeah you might not want to be out to your colleagues so uh, but i did mention uh, any in the closet colleague will feel much more at home in uh, hsbc uh, india with all the activities they do uh, because we show we are inclusive and, and we'll be less afraid so because of these differences between companies and countries I think it's crucial we share experiences, share best practices, uh, also share where things don't work so that we can learn from that, uh, celebrate each other's success, uh, invite each other to activities, uh, because I think that's the way we, we can help support uh, and create more inclusive workplaces. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to ask whether anyone has any maybe experiences to share of how they've um, um, gained support from external organisations to help develop their internal pride network and inclusion initiatives. Um, perhaps I could ask Paul if he has any um, experience of either um, gaining support learning from other organizations or conversely where Clifford Chance uh, has uh, so has been able to offer support to to um, external partnerships or internal Sorry. maybe off other offices within your within your company yes so um, so quite <laughs> just quite a few things um, so f first of all um, I think internally uh, what what we have uh, developed over the years uh, is what we call an call an Arcus roadmap, uh, which basically is intended to uh, create uh, a guide, I suppose, uh, for different offices uh, within the network. Uh, and, and what it does is to identify various areas, uh, for example, HR practices, and and it goes from sort of foundational level. Um, all the way to aspirational. And, and what we do with this roadmap is that it helps, I think, um, the, the Pride Networks within uh, various uh, locations uh, to just uh, A, give them some uh, sort of pointers as to how to go about starting a Pride Network in those jurisdictions, um, some of which, as all for the state, can be fairly conservative. Uh, but it also helps us to, to create and maintain momentum because it, it, it keeps us, uh, it, it has aspirational goals as well to which all the officers are, are really are looking to, to ensure that we continue to strive towards. So, so that's been helpful in, in keeping us uh, supporting each other as well and, and sort of sharing lessons across the network. Um, I mean, in terms of engagement with, with external organizations and companies, um, you know, in, in addition to, to fellow uh, competitors uh, uh, that, that we network with, uh, we, also, we also have outreach programs with, with clients. Um, I mean, th this uh, platform today is, is a good example of how, how we support each other. Um, we also network with LGBTQ friendly businesses. Uh, we have an annual Pride Art Day as well, in which we would engage with um, art galleries, and various other businesses that are associated with that. Um, you know, we, we engage with uh, Uga Chaga as well, which provides sort of counseling and training uh, and sensitivity uh, uh, programs. So, um, so these are the ways in which I think we try to create uh, networks, uh, both internally and externally, um, create a sort of a self uh, reinforcing and self perpetuating, uh, hopefully, um, system of, of um, uh, collaboration with. Um, with various um, parties and organizations and firms. Okay, thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, due to time constraints, I am going to have to wrap up the first segment of this event. Um, don't worry, panelists, if there's any burning thoughts in your mind, we will reconvene shortly. So there will be an opportunity to share any additional thoughts, uh, not in, in, in a short moment, in a, in a short amount of time. Um, I'm just gonna explain to all attendees on the call 
um, what will happen now moving into the second part of our event. So thank you to our panelists, first and foremost, for a really, really interesting panel discussion. Now, on the back of that, we are going to split up into a number of breakout rooms. That will be the panelists and all attendees on the line for a um, networking session slash a deeper dive into some of the conversations that have been uh, that, that have been raised on uh, during this event. Um, each there, there will be four breakout rooms. Uh, each breakout room will be under the banner of one of the four topics that um, we've um, gone through this morning. Um, the allocation will be random, but I'm sure that, uh, that that whichever breakout room you do end up in will be a very rousing and interesting discussion. Um, I'd like to encourage all attendees, please keep your audio and if possible video on so that you can engage with your um, panelist host. Um, and there'll also be a facilitator within each breakout room from the British Chamber of Commerce to help um, moderate that discussion. Um, if you have any questions, please do ask your um, your facilitator and panelist. panelist. Um, we will be moving shortly into those breakout rooms in just a few moments. Okay, it looks like we have all attendees back in the main meeting room. Well, hello and welcome back. Um, I hope you all had a interesting and productive discussion in your breakout rooms. For this third segment of the event, we're going to be hearing from um, our panelists and the uh, breakout room facilitators, some feedback and some thoughts that were raised as within your breakout sessions as part of your the deeper dive. Um, I'm going to be sticking to the same four topics that um, that we utilized for the first segment of the meeting and then also for the breakout rooms and running in the same order. And so on that note, I'm going to start by uh, handing over to Joanna and Anna um, on their feedback from their meeting, which was a business case. Why is this important? A discussion on the business case for LGBT plus inclusion initiatives. Joanna and Anna. Sure, um, I can start. We were talking a little bit more about um, launching, um, you know, diversity and inclusion and how to kind of drive early on initiatives. Um, and the focus was on partnerships. So what are the kind of, what are good internal, external partners? Um, so we were talking about um, training or um, external kind of um organizations here in Singapore that are great from a LGBTQ or broader diversity and inclusion um, agenda. Um, so we talked about Uga Changa, who I know has been mentioned a few times already in this chat, obviously um, a really popular partner and also about AWARE. Um, so, you know, they are more um, focused on women's rights, but also an established charity that's been going for a really long time that have a very strong um, agenda here in Singapore and a great partner to work with um, for anyone that's starting a more broad diversity and inclusion um, agenda. Anna, anything else to add? Yeah, I think just touching on the other topic that we covered as well was around the, the paradigm shift after the ban on participation on, on MNCs um, in in Pink Dot and, and just how much that's created uncertainty within MNCs about, um, you know, we feel that there's perhaps a, a misconception to some extent about not being able to, to push too vocally for, for equality in LBG, LGBTQ matters. So um, I know many people here are, are from sort of large corporate organisations and, and that is um, something that many of us have felt that challenge and perhaps just a bit of uncertainty about how much you can advocate for these things. And um, we spoke about two things there about the benefit of when you are in a, a global um, company to be able to leverage your global networks to push for um, these matters internally. So just to help to be able to promote but internally. Um, 
as well as then tapping into your Singaporean colleagues and, and hearing from those within the local um, context and, and making sure that you're hearing that those local voices um, who can really help to sort of shape and um, position, you, you know, their view on, on how to help advocate for change locally. And, and, you know, maybe that's tapping into Singaporean colleagues or, or those within your network outside the organisation, perhaps that's engaging in other kind of industry um, associations or, or support networks that, that we touched on earlier, um, you know, to help make sure that you're hearing from a really broad, diverse um, group of, of perspectives. Okay, thank you both. Sounds like some really interesting discussions. Um, thank you for those insights. Um, I'm going to hand over now to um, our second breakout room, which was setting up what are the basics to get right, a discussion on the core deliverables for a network in its infancy. And that was led by Paul and Toby. Thanks, James. Um, I'm sure everybody saw 15 minutes ago very quickly, so it was uh, quite, a, quite a quick discussion. Um, but I was joined by, uh, Paul and myself, sorry, I was joined by uh, Dimi and, and Deepak and Dimi is um, uh, works for FTI Consulting and is the, the head of HR in the region and, and Deepak uh, a business manager working in construction um, and Deepak was saying um, I guess his priorities in a, a very male dominated um, construction uh, sector is primarily at the moment around gender and um, gender diversity and um, helping to facilitate women into um, kind of leadership positions so weren't quite at a stage where they were looking at pride networks just yet um, and Dimi is just in the process of, of setting um, up the pride network so kind of two perfect uh, people to join us in our breaking breakout room around setting up um, but we agreed uh, that the kind of general themes uh, across uh, for, for both Dimi and Deepak were still around staff engagement um, and how you can um, try and ensure staff are engaging in these activities that, that the organizations are, are putting on um, we kind of one of the themes was around kind of low hanging fruit and what can you do in, in the first uh, instances to try and um, in terms of the, the basics, what can you do that's relatively easy? And I think that's particularly important sometimes when it, there might not be a large number of people that are involved in the first instance of, of, of trying to set things up. And um, one of the things that Dimi picked up on from Paul's conversation was around uh, the, the DNI question that he had as part of his recruitment process. Uh, so whilst um, kind of core learning and development modules um, might be a little bit further down the line. There are certain things in terms of uh, kind of quick wins and, and uh, easier things to embed, um, such as uh, DNI questions in recruitment. So low hanging fruit was a theme. Um, uh, Deepak also kind of touched on the fact that, that it's important to learn from other organisations. You don't always have to reinvent the wheel. And I think that's um, why events like this are, are important and reaching out and building your network and learning from others um, uh, will be particularly important to, uh, in, in the first kind of development stages or initiation phases of, of Pride Networks. Um, so low hanging fruit and, and learning from others were, were two key themes. We were just getting into a discussion on um, how you can uh, celebrate diversity uh, as a theme and celebrating and differences um, and using that as a, as a core theme, whether it's gender, ethnicity or LGBT. Um, it's uh, about that, that celebration of difference. Um, so those were the, the key themes coming from, from our, our session. Brilliant. Um, Paul, anything to add from your, your end? Uh, no, I think, I think Toby has summarized it uh, very well. Uh, I, 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 perhaps the, the one thing that, that um, came across, and I, I think just now from, from the summaries of the first session as, as well, is, is this idea or, or this uh, concern about um, how setting up a pride network or being involved in this will be perceived, uh, particularly in in Singapore. Uh, I think that's you know that's a legitimate uh, concern. Uh, the the only thing I would say is that um, I, I I don't I mean obviously there are many many of us for example um, who have set up pride networks uh, in Singapore and in the Singapore context and have been operating it for for a very long time uh, without uh, any. Uh, backlash or, or repercussions or, or whatever the case may, may be. Um, uh, so I think, I think in Singapore, one just needs to be sensitive about, you know, the, the political uh, environment uh, and um, perhaps, uh, you know, just be, be aware of where 
um, that line is between sort of uh, public advocacy, which which may be you know something one would have to think quite carefully about, versus um, internal uh, uh, organization in which uh, you are supporting uh, fellow colleagues uh, in uh, in DNI initiatives and and you know sort of recruiting um, on that basis, retaining talent on that basis. I think these are very much seen as, as uh, internal issues to, to companies. I, I don't see that as being uh, particularly problematic uh, whatsoever. And even um, sort of collaborations across firms and organizations, uh, such as a discussion like ours this morning, uh, I certainly don't see that uh, as an issue. So, so I think um, you know, for, for anyone who's sort of starting out, uh, uh, being concerned about, about that, um, uh, issue. Um, talk to any one of us. I think we have experience uh, in this area. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, but I would say that that I think for me, probably convincing internal management that this is a, a good thing to do is probably more difficult uh, a challenge uh, than than actually oh, you know what one might think um, the the public or the governmental sort of perception would be of of us organizing ourselves in this way. I think you raised some really good points there, Paul. At the end of the day, we are all looking to create an inclusive atmosphere within our workplaces um, where our members can be their full authentic selves in the workplace. And events like this is just it is intercompany collaboration where we're all learning for each, uh, each other to create that atmosphere within our workplaces. And as you say, Paul, it is done many many times before in 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 singapore there are many pride networks active but there are certainly challenges in convincing senior stakeholders perhaps that the 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 inclusivity is there and there there are no political barriers if it's done in an internally facing and culturally sensitive way Okay, well, it sounds like a very packed 15 minute discussion, uh, Paul and Toby, thank you for feeding back. Um, so moving on to our third breakout room, maintaining momentum. What challenges might we face? A discussion on overcoming barriers on the journey and how companies can support each other to establish and maintain pride initiative. I apologize, that was the wrong description. Let me recap. Um, sorry, maintaining momentum was what's really involved, a discussion on the core requirements to keep a network visible and active. And I'm gonna hand over to Oliver and Andrew to um, feedback on how uh, on, on, their, on their breakout session. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, we, we had a great discussion in, in our uh, breakout room. Um, we, we touched on many of the points um, that, that Paul mentioned. Uh, how do you um, adapt global policies to the Singapore market? Um, there was a lot of discussion about um, uh, kind of balancing with faith groups internally, um, particularly being sensitive to, to different faiths in the region. Um, one of our members had been told by their senior management um, that the that, that pride group should keep a lower profile because there would be concerns members would would leave the organization because of, of this organization's involvement in pride which we we all felt was um, not really anything um, people you know should would really take seriously but it, it, it is a message that has come through from some some people's management and and something that we need to be aware of um, a, a, a lot of discussion was on generational change, um, how attitudes are becoming more tolerant uh, with the younger generation, and that's going to help as, as as we progress, and 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 that's also helping to change the attitudes of the the older, more senior uh, generation in in organisations. Um, and then we also spoke about how we're adapting to COVID. Uh, traditionally, pride groups have been a networking event, and we we haven't been able to do that. Uh, given the given the COVID environment and, and how we've had to adapt to to web events and and interregional or or interconnecting with with other internal groups, um, but but overall very very um, active discussion, very very good good number of topics coming out. Oliver, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, no, I think that 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 was that was a good discussion. I think the 
the discussion about faith and LGBT was an interesting one, which I didn't have a clear answer. And I think it's, 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 I don't know whether anyone on the panel or anyone on the moderators or facilitators have an opinion on that. I think that's something that I struggle with. I think, um, you know, how do we kind of toe the line between respecting faith and respecting, you know, sexual orientation. Um, I think that's something, at least within Barclays, that, you know, the line is always that, you know, we are non-discriminatory against either or. Um, but I understand that, you know, in a country where, you know, there is um, a lot of faith-based policies and faith-based groups, um, it's, it's, it's a struggle, I think. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that we'll, we'll, we'll probably need to progress on a bit more. Uh, within Barclays and, and outside as well. Oliver, that's something that we've tackled as well. And, and for us, um, just like you say, it was about acknowledging differences and just reiterating that, you know, it's not one over the other. It's mm. about acknowledging that everyone, um, you know, respecting differences and, and everyone is entitled to their perspectives and and yeah. just um, reiterating that, that all the events are voluntary and, and those that don't feel comfortable attending it are not required to, but likewise, you know, it goes the other way. So uh, I guess that's where the inclusion piece is really big as well in terms of just, again, being open-minded and respect of, respectful of differences. Yeah. Actually, um, I was talking in our breakout room um, group about a podcast that I was just listening to called Saga, which is about um, the early um, earlier sort of development of aware and LGBTQ plus and women's rights movements in Singapore. And it does talk a lot about that question around faith and religion and um, LGBTQ and women's rights. So if you want to hear, you know, a little bit from a different perspective, that might be an interesting thing for you guys to listen to as well. It's called Saga. S-A-G-A, is that how yeah. it's spelled? Yes, that's right. I've got it When you look at the latest kind of communication from the government, from Minister Shanmugam, it is very much respect goes all way, always. So it's very much in line with what you were saying. Like, uh, we need to not discriminate against any religion, but also religion should not discriminate against LGBT. And I mean, it goes always respect our differences. That's the only way we get true diversity. So I think it, the latest kind of narrative from the ministry is, I think, in line with that. Really well said there. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm going to hand over to our um, the leaders of our final breakout room, which was supporting others. What challenges might we face? A discussion on overcoming barriers on the journey and how companies can support each other to establish and maintain pride initiatives. And so I'll hand over to Olfert and Maitlin, who um, were was leading that discussion. Maitlin, you would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we did share a number of the themes that have already been raised. I think there were some um, challenges from our participants, um, Meg from Control Whisks and Juliet and Kate from Dulwich College, purely around how do they find out who else is active within Pride Networks and how can they then share their um, how can they then share their experiences? Um, and Alfred um, shared that obviously in in the different markets he's worked in, such as the Netherlands, um, you know, organ organizations are very, pardon the pun, but they're very proud to be part of Pride, whereas obviously in other um, countries such as Singapore, we have to perhaps be more mindful of local nuances. Um, so a couple of things that were flagged in our um, group, which was obviously we can't, uh, companies can't actively sponsor Pink Dot. However, Pink Dot do run something called Pink Week. Um, and Olfit shared that um, his organization had last year joined a career fair, um, which could be a way of raising profile. Um, and then um, Meg shared that um, she has recently participated in an organization called Open for Business, um, which is a network in group and they are happy to share things like training um, content and material that they've run previously so that may be um, some forums where people can find some other um, places where they can get some some opportunities to share information um, and I think the other biggest takeaway was really that 
you have to be in Singapore mindful of the local nuances. So perhaps it's easier um, to include the LGBT plus um, diversity and inclusion um, subject matter within wider DNI um, discussion topics. Um, and really, I think my takeaway from something Olfit said was focus on the most important thing, which was creating a workplace where our colleagues can be themselves rather than trying to change the world. So that was uh, pretty much my takeaways from our discussion. Yeah, I'll first start. Uh, my takeaway indeed is very much aligned and it's, it's there's a clear kind of demand or need for more sharing and uh, people eager to learn more and share more. So I think there is a, a demand. Um, one, one small thing, uh, I, I, I know I called it pink wheat, but it's called Pink Fest, so look it up uh, if you do wanna. Uh, if you do wanna participate uh, in uh, some activities that are not Pink Dot related, but much more uh, kind of closed door, and therefore uh, foreign companies can participate. It's called uh, Pink Fest, and they're organizing it virtually again this year. So. Okay. One thing I just wanted to, to to add as well, James, if I can, is that of course for, for some people, for some staff who who might not be out in, in organizations might not engage, even the existence of these pride works will be important to them. So even just knowing that their organization has a pride network, whether they engage or not. Um, and I know that I used to kind of work in our, our, our London office and you'd always be a little bit disappointed sometimes if there was a low attendance at events. I think it's important to remember when we do all of this, that it is so worth it. And there will be people in our organizations who just the very existence of that pride work and um, pride network will, will mean the world to them and um, so we should be i guess proud of the work and the efforts that we are all, all making in this space because i think it makes a, a real difference to people they might not ever thank you for it because they might not be in a position to but um it's just something i think we should hold on to thank you that's a really good point toby visibility is key in in in, in fostering that that inclusive environment that we're all talking about um about uh, about creating in our uh, in our workplaces um are there any um final thoughts from our panelists uh, so actually thank you very much for feeding back on your um on your breakout session um following following that uh, are there any final remarks that uh, that uh, that you'd like to leave us with before we close uh, close this session maybe we can start with joanna um, look, I think um, for me, um, what Toby was kind of saying about um, how important this work is, you know, sometimes I think when you're looking to launch something new, it does feel like a hard slog. But for me, um, you know, the experience um, of the personal side of how diversity and inclusion actually impacts people, doing this work is one of the most fulfilling parts of, of my job. So I absolutely echo um, what Toby said. And I think, you know, just on a business case side of it, we talked about the people and this is what drives diversity and inclusion, the importance of people. Um, we talked about customers and how customers are becoming discerning about who they partner with and that they have those diversity and inclusion initiatives in place. And then we talked about brand and the fact that young people Google and there is definitely um, change that's coming through Singapore where it's becoming really more important to the younger generations that we have clear diversity and inclusion policies in place and they choose workplaces according to that. So I think all of those things are really, really important and can be used to take back and, and drive the importance um, of diversity and inclusion in business. Thank you, Joanna. Paul, any closing comments from your end? So, so the only thing I would say is that um, I think uh, you have more friends than you think you you might have, uh, and that we're all here to support um, any organization or anyone who is looking to uh, start something like a Pride Network or, or some form of, of it within your, your firm or organization or company, um, and that we're all here to help. Um, so feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Great message. Uh, Oliver, any closing remarks? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I echo what Paul and Joanna said. I think I take, you know, great pride, no pun intended, in what I do. Um, I wish, you know, when I was growing up, there was, you know, a role model that I could look up to, to, you know, to, to, to ensure that there is inclusion in the workplace. I think there is power in not only visibility, but representation. Um, so I'm happy, um, you know, to be where I am now and, you know, grateful for everything that's happened. So if anyone wants to reach out, uh, please feel free to do so. Oliver and finally Alpha any closing remarks from yourself? No very much echo what Oliver just said I, I think Singapore lacked a bit of senior role models especially in business so if all of us can be be visible wearing our lanyards uh, stickers on my laptop etc I'm much more out and proud here than I would be in London just because I think it's good to have some some executive visibility uh, role models so so that's I think that's key. Um, I'm very positive. I do see indeed the, 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 the younger generation very much more open and uh, accepting the topic. So I think there, there is a bright future, but uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. And on that note, thank you very much to all of our panelists and our facilitators for being here and being visible today um, and taking part in a very important discussion. Um, and so I'd like to um, thank our speakers again. Um, their names have gone. And uh, before we wrap up, I'm just going to uh, go through some upcoming events with the British Chamber of Commerce on the 23rd of March with the future of data in Asia Pacific. On the 25th of March, we have a webinar from peak to peak with explorer Grant Axe Rawlinson. On the 31st of March, an interactive crisis communications war game, Can You Save Your Reputation? And finally, on the 5th of May, um, the future of work with Marcus Buckingham. Um, we will be issuing an event s feedback slash survey form for to all attendees. Uh, we would be very grateful if you could keep an eye out for this and fill in with any feedback. We'd love to hear from, from, from hear from you. And also, please do reach out to myself or any of panelists as as noted if you have any questions uh, or or any you just want to chat about um lgbt plus inclusion in the workplace would be more than happy to respond thank you very much everyone for your time today <laughs>